How you doing, Dr. Ulysses Jackson? Welcome back to another Mental Health Monday, where we meet here every Monday where we discuss mental health issues briefly or something that could be associated with mental health. This week, I decided to bring up a topic um, that's kind of dear to me because a lot of people I know are experiencing this issue, and it's almost like a silent killer. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of people don't understand the connection between gambling and addiction. Now, addictive personality, we usually think of addiction as something like food disorder, eating disorder, or we think of uh, addiction as cocaine, heroin, and alcohol. But let's look at addiction through a holistic approach, through a mind, body, and spirit thing. So why does the alcoholic drink. He usually drinks, he or she drinks because, you know, they have this compulsion and this obsession to use more alcohol. What happens with any addiction is it starts at levels and the levels that it usually goes with are mild, moderate, and then severe. See, someone that has an eating disorder or usually binge eats or something, you know, it starts off with snacking and even a little more than normal. Um, and then that eating becomes an issue and becomes a problem. My specialization is in mental health and substance abuse, which the substance could be an addiction or something. And some people have a predisposed disposition with being addicted to things. You know, they'll say like, if your mother or father was an alcoholic, you're prone to be an alcoholic. Some of these addictive behaviors are learned such as gambling. Now, in every state, especially in New York and Long Island, where I'm from, there's a talk of from OTP, OTB betting to uh, casino gambling in Long Island and in Queens, and even people travel to New Jersey, to Atlantic City, people who fly to Vegas to gamble. The statistics show that like one out of 10 people in America is going to be addicted to gambling because of this behavior. Again, I like to show the, the connection and association because some people would think, well, he's an alcoholic or she's a cokehead or he's a crackhead or they're on heroin. Think of this, when you're gambling, the obsession and compulsion to use. So I, right here I have the DSM-5. Take a look at that. This has, and look how thick that is, right? This right here is the manual of all disorders and addictive personalities and, and behaviors that can become addictive or problematic. And in that book, on page 85, as I printed it out right here, it says, on well, page 85, we're going to see what gambling is. I want to be so precise with this, I don't want to say this off the top of my head. I want to give it to you as it's given to everyone else. Clear and precise. What addictive disorder is when it comes to gambling. It says gambling is persistent and recurring problematic gambling behavior. Your gambling has become a problem. Your gamma had become problematic and it's been brought to clinical significant attention, which means it's no longer just you notices this. Your family, your friends, your loved one knows this. And this will be followed by certain factors that are displayed for 12 months. So for certain, dis for certain disorders to kick in to be considered a gamma disorder, this has had to go on for at least 12 months. If you didn't reach that threshold, you don't meet the criteria. And a gambling disorder is considered F63.10, which is also insurance is billable by that. That if you have gambling things, depending on the facility you go to, because it is a disorder. And the first point it says, and I want y'all to follow this, that whether it's you or someone you know or loved one, one of the first things you want to recognize is that the person needs to gamble with increased amount of money in order 
to achieve excitement. So that dollar scratch off ain't big enough no more. That playing lotto ticket, that, ain't, that ain't, one, increasing amount of money must be used in order to achieve the desired excitement. That's those bells and whistles going off. You know, a dollar gets you five. Five gets you 30. 30 gets you 900. So, so it's progressive. The second thing is that the person becomes restless and irritable when attempting to cut down or stop gambling. If that's you, a loved one, somebody like that, then you know y'all got an issue. Let me get up here a little closer personal with y'all so y'all can really catch what I'm saying. The person becomes restless, irritable when attempting to cut down on gambling. That means you've already recognized that something's wrong. See, when I was younger, I used to play CeeLo. And you put 100 down, 500 down when you win. The winning was great. The winning was gravy. It was the losing that was a problem. So I learned at a young age that, like, I can't put my money on the ground and not pick it up. I, I had a problem with that, you know, and I lost some friends behind that, and I destroyed some good relationships behind that. But I cut that off early. And when I was in Vegas last year, somebody was telling me about Tent City and that most of the people that are now homeless living in Tent City in Vegas, a lot of them aren't even residents of Vegas. They came to Vegas to win it big. Now, I just did my last um, mental health Monday was on rest and relaxation. Imagine I was on a vacation and I had this gambling disorder. Um, and I come back and I say, I got to tell my girl, listen, um, ain't no dinner tonight. And we might not make it even back home. And the bank account joint, I come on. That's the reality that happens. But because we're aware that this type of stuff could happen and we understand the addictive personality, we try to back up from that because then we learn by our mistakes. We learn by, like, listen, I, I put that 5,000, I won 50, I put up the 50, I lost it all. At what point, what's the cutoff point? You know what I'm saying? So gambling, this is very important because we got to stop pointing the fingers at, well, I'm not bad as him or I'm not as bad as her or I'm not like them. No, there's gambling. It has criteria and levels to this thing. So, again, we say the second part was the person become restless and irritable and attempt to cut down on gambling. So if you know somebody that experiences that or even yourself, take notice to that. The third criteria for this thing, it says the person that made repeated unsuccessful efforts to control or cut back on their gambling. This is when you start to know, like the alcoholic, I'm not going to drink no more. And they keep drinking. Or I'm, I'm not going to do coke no more. Or I'm only going to do this on Friday, Saturday. It start, that's, when it's, that's when it's that that mild, that moderate, and that severe. Because I'm hearing people at these casinos locally around where I live that like, you find women and men sitting and saying, how am I going to tell my spouse that I, I gambled up the mortgage money? Or... We have nothing. See, it's those bells and whistles. And this is all addictive personality. So how do we address these addictive personalities? Again, I got to come with the disclaimer. This is not a clinical session. This is information. I want you to go pick up this book or Google the DSM-5. Put in gambling disorder, page 85, and read what it's about. And then you know if that fits your criteria, then you fall into that spectrum. Like before when COVID was running around, I got COVID and got cured of it and I got sick again. And I thought that um, I thought that I had COVID again, but I went back to the doctor and they checked me and I had the flu. So sometimes we have to check what we have, that do we meet these criteria? The fourth criteria says that the person is preoccupied with gambling, having thoughts and reliving past gambling experiences, handicapping them the venture to do anything else with their money. That's the money right there. Your thoughts is preoccupied with gambling. The win. We ain't thinking about the loss. We think about the win. When can I can I win again one day? You know what I'm saying? And these are criteria that we look at. Do you have preoccupied thoughts with gambling? That's that compulsion and that obsession to use. That's that I gotta win. But hella hot water, I, I gotta win something. 
The fifth criteria says, gambling, you feel helpless, hopeless, anxious, depressed, or guilty. See what that hit was right there? When the, for the gambler or the person that you know is your friend that gambled, watch them and their behavior. Are they feeling distressed, helpless, hopeless, guilty, anxious, or depressed? These are criteria that's going to make you come in and say, you know what? They might have a problem with this. So is gambling addictive? Is a gambling a disease? Is gambling part of a disorder? Is gambling in the DSM-5 Diagnostic Statistical Manual? Absolutely. The sixth criteria says, after losing money, you return the next day or days later chasing a loss. It ain't saying chasing a high or chasing a drink or the drug. It specifically says on page 86 that you now are chasing a loss, that you think I could win better. I had, I had a, a, um, a friend of mine that was going through a gambling issue. And one time he told me, he said, I got it all mapped out. I said, what? He said, I got it all mapped out how to win this money. I said, how? He said, you do this, this, and that. Later on, he told me, you know, you didn't know, but I won big and I lost bigger. And I thought I had it mapped out and I, don't, I no longer gamble. Now check this. If you find yourself in a casino or at the dice game or at the little, little spot at the end of the night and this is what you gotta do, you're lying and concealing the extent of your involvement with gambling with your family and friends and your loved ones. Now, I don't gamble that much. I only, I only gamble five dollars, and you don't lose ten thousand. And you're sitting there saying, "Well, if I take the mortgage and I flip it, maybe I could win some, win it bigger." That's the thought. That's chasing a high. That's chasing a loss. These are things that we gotta address, man. And we gotta we'll go look for some help for this, man. You know, talk to a friend. Talk to someone. Let's say, you know. Like, if, if you're my friend, I know you got a, a drinking problem. Whether we shooting pool or so, I'm not bringing you to a bar. You know what I'm saying? Um, if I know you have anything that you're addicted to that I know that I could kind of be an intervention, I'm not bringing you there. It's like somebody with some, I don't drink. So if I was somebody want to drink, I'm not going to go to the local casino and I know they have a gambling problem or they have a gambling issue. The same way... The sex addict can say he's addicted to sex or porn. The same way the alcoholic says, I'm going to AA, I'm going to Alcoholics Anonymous. And a person dealing with substance abuse, heroin, coke, crack, can say I'm going to NA. It's okay for you to say, listen, man, I got a problem with these bells and whistles and me wanting to win. It's okay, man. We None, none of us is perfect, man. Nobody got a halo over their head. This whole thing is about discovering and uncovering where we at in our life, man. Because you might not know you have a problem with even eating until one day you keep getting on that scale and that, that your weight keep going up. You're like, yo, listen, what? Well, I think I got a problem with eating, man. I eat too much. You know what I'm saying? So sometimes we don't look and think that we have a problem until it becomes a problem. So these are things to look out for. So again, I said, if losing money, you return the next day chasing the loss or you lie to your family or loved ones to conceal your gambling habit. The next hit was this. You jeopardize relationships. What is that? I'm not saying this, but this is what the Diagnostic Statistical Manual says. What happened to gamblers and gambling behavior. It says the person jeopardized the loss of significant relationships such as jobs, education, career opportunities because of gambling. You can't get to work on time. You ain't got the gas to get to work. You don't gamble up all the money. Your wife, your husband, your partner, get ready to leave you behind that. So gambling, yeah, this is significant, man. And the last point, it says, relies on others to provide them with money to relieve the desperation of financial situation that, that they're in caused by gambling. So again, Mental Health Mondays, Dr. Ulysses Jackson. I want to touch on is gambling addictive? So if you, I'm going to run it down real quick. So if you experience any of these major issues, such as the need to gamble, Increase the amount of money that you gambled with. You're restless and irritable about gambling. You made repeated unsuccessful attempts to stop gambling. You often are preoccupied with going back to the casino. 
You're feeling distressed. You're feeling anxious. You're feeling hopeless. You're feeling depressed behind gambling. Losing money to gambling, you return the next day or a few days later chasing your loss. You conceal how much money you've lost to your loved ones. You jeopardize your relationships with people and family. And last, you go to others and you ask them for relief to borrow money and desperation because you became in a financial situation. So is gambling addictive in your life? Do you know somebody who's addicted to gambling? Dr. Ulysses Jackson, thanks for following me again on another Mental Health Monday where we address gambling. Don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, and hit that thumbs up, man. And let me know what y'all want to talk about. If you know somebody that got a gambling issue, you got gambling anonymous hotline, you got most mental health counselors, social workers, and support groups to help them with that, try to get somebody connected. And if it's you, don't feel ashamed or embarrassed. Reach out to someone. Dr. Ulysses Jackson, another Mental Health Mondays. Thanks.